tonight. Uh, we are ordaining Jared McNaughton to the ministry uh, of God's word and his uh, sacraments. Uh, we are. Now, the presbytery, uh, the regional body, ministers and elders from everywhere as far as Tenterfield, uh, going right down to Tamworth, which is the other end, for the Tenterfield people, uh, and uh, also, of course, uh, Manila. So uh, now to Walker. So all of that area is the presbytery, and we have uh, members of the presbytery here tonight because we are, as a Presbyterian church, we are to ordain and set apart Jared McNaughton to the ministry of uh, Tamworth Community Presbyterian Church. So I've welcomed people, welcome on Zoom or whatever you're on. Facebook, I think it was. Anyway. Now the thing, but we can read. That's permissible. So we're going to read together Psalm uh, 67. Uh, so we'll read it aloud and together. You'll find it on the screen if you'd uh, rather uh, read it in Chinese. That's fine, I think. It is, yes. So uh, and it's God's word in whatever language. There's no dual Greek, Chinese or Australian in God's eyes. So the title says, For the Director of Music, with stringed instruments, so they had guitars back in those days. Anyway, a psalm, a song. Let's read it aloud and together. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples justly and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. Then the land will yield its harvest and God, our God, will bless us. God will bless us and all the ends of the earth will fear him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this promise that you will be gracious to us and bless us. We know that that's happened in real history because Jesus came into the world and showed all of your grace, your blessing, your keeping your promise going right back to Abraham and before. Thousands of years of promises, thousands of years of blessing, and you keep your promises. You are the God who blesses your people. You're the God who makes your way known. You're the God who makes your, shows your salvation among all the nations in our Lord Jesus Christ. And we bow before you. All glory be to Christ tonight as we uh, gather as uh, your people, as we gather as a presbytery to ordain and set apart Jared McNaughton to the ministry of Tamworth Community Presbyterian Church. We pray for your blessing. We pray that you'll that what we do together will be uh, uh, receive. You, you will, your face will shine upon us. Uh, you, you will uh, bless us, uh, not because we're doing something good in one sense, though we are. We think it's good, but um, uh, not because we're good either. Uh, we, we gather not because we're good people, but because you are the good and gracious. You're the salvation God. You're the God who blesses. And it's not we are that are good. It's you that are good and generous and gracious and forgiving in the Lord Jesus. And so we thank you that you have promised you will bless us. Uh, the land will yield its harvest. Our God, our God will bless us and all the ends of the earth. Well, Tamworth is one of the ends of the earth, if you live on the other side at least. But uh, we pray that uh, your blessing will extend over this whole world. We do want to pray for those in particular need and trouble tonight, those who can't be with us or those who feel that they uh, can't uh, come and gather in case of uh, health issues or that they might be worried about this uh, particular virus. Uh, we thank you that pretty well it stayed away from us here in rural and regional Australia. We thank you for that. And uh, we pray for your protection 
your grace and your comfort to surround those for whom this has uh, been a really tough time. Those whose businesses are suffering, those whose uh, families are separated, those who are sick and those who uh, can't uh, go and visit grandma like they used to. Uh, so you know the situation of each of us. We've each got some particular matter of pain and trouble. But we thank you for your promise uh, that you will bless us. Uh, we thank you that you are gracious. You're the God who has shown your salvation among the nations in the Lord Jesus. Do bless us as we meet together for this uh, wonderful purpose, we pray. In the name of our Lord Jesus, amen. The reading comes from tonight from 1 Timothy uh, 6, starting from chapter 2. These are the things you are to teach and urge on them. If anyone teaches false doctrines and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the godly teaching, he is conceited and understands nothing. He, is an un he has an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between men of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we had food and clothing, we will, be con we will all be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men, plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you, when you made your con good confession in the presence of, of many witnesses. In the sight of God who gives life to everything and of Christ Jesus who while testifying before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession. I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has has seen or can see, to him be honour and might forever. Amen. Well, if we're ready, we're going to cross live, I think it is, to the Reverend Andrew Clawson in South West Queensland by the miracles of technology. It's not me, it's Andrew. I think I'm there. There we are. Uh, we're not only one hour behind, but several seconds. <laughs> well, I'm sorry I couldn't be with you all tonight because our Premier decided uh, to apparently protect us, the people of New South Wales. May the Lord protect us from our Premier. Uh, let's pray as we come to this portion of God's Word, this very special night. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to your sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. To quote R.C. Sproul, it takes more than just being a Christian who wears trousers to be a Christian leader. For Timothy, that leadership is spelt out in the opening of this letter as Paul entrusts the continued purity of Christ's good news, which is to be taught in Ephesus to his former apprentice. Chapter one spells it out that Timothy is to take command, instructing certain people 
not to teach false doctrines any longer or to promote myths and controversial speculations rather than advancing God's kingdom agenda. Timothy is to promote the work of God and not his own personal ambitions, nor his own ideologies, nor fleshliness like that of Alexander in 1 Timothy 1 or Hymenaeus and, and Philetus in 2 Timothy 2. False brothers who would worm their way into the homes of weak-willed women and susceptible women. What were these men engaging in? Now, I'd suggest that Paul is purposely vague. Recently, Daniil and I stayed at a hotel on the Sunshine Coast in Queensland, where a sign on our fifth story balcony read, by order of the Chief Medical Officer and the Premier of Queensland, you are not permitted to spit from Queensland balconies. Now, I confess I've never had a desire to spit from a New South Wales balcony, let alone a Queensland balcony, at least until the law told me that it was indeed a possibility to entertain. It is sufficient enough that Paul warns us against any form of sexual misconduct. He wisely knows that fleshly talk only stimulates wrong eye uh, desires and any theology that detracts from the apostolic gospel is to be avoided in any case. My wife, who was trained as a bank teller back in the 1990s, tells me the trainers didn't show tellers examples of counterfeit banknotes. Instead, they familiarised the new staff with the intricacies of real legal tender. That way, fake notes just stood out for what they were. Thirteen times in the Timothy epistles, Paul will instruct Timothy and the elders, in fact, he will insist that they be familiar with the handling of the apostolic gospel. They are to know the gospel. Indeed, we don't need to study the cults. We need only to know the gospel so that the cults become blatantly apparent to us. We need only know what biblical truth is, rather than the intricacies of Alexander's heresy, whatever its content was. Through years of study at college and beyond those years, I know that Jared has prepared himself in the knowledge of the gospel. As the Puritans remind us, we are to preach the gospel to ourselves every day. We never outgrow the study of God's word. Timothy, now reminded of his role as a gatekeeper of the apostolic gospel here in chapter 1, Paul moves on in chapter 2 to outline what true worship of God looks like in light of what the scripture teaches. And then instructions on the appointment of fellow servants in chapter 3. And finally, we reach chapter 6 where the gravity of, T of Timothy's task as a ministering under-shepherd of Christ is now summed up in the single phrase. As for you, O man of God. The pastor's connection to the Old Testament prophets is to be understood in that very simple phrase. You, O man of God. There are only 13 instances in the Old Testament where this designation is used. And some of these Old Testament servants are not even named by name, but simply referred to as God's prophets. But some are men who are very familiar to us. Men like Samuel, Moses, David, Elijah, and Elisha. Arguably what they all have in common is that they presided over periods of enormous or great change and great apostasy in the history of God's people. Periods when men of faith would be called upon to challenge the behaviours of nations and the actions of kings and leaders. Periods where the very word of God was at threat of disappearing if these men of God proved unfaithful in their calling. A farmer like Elisha, whom upon God's calling to ministry, slays the oxen that he stood behind, burns his plough with the sacrifice. We are given a picture in Timothy's mind eye that there is to be no going back as Elisha burns the tools of his past trade. Men of God are to heed their calling 
without thought of going back. With that thought in Timothy's rear vision, by chapter 6, we're now ready to hear Paul's charge to his young preacher. Verses 11 and 12 are Paul's exhortations. Paul's final charge, which will come in verses 13 to 16, are preceded by these four unforgettable principles to the pastor. Here they are, the four Fs. Flee, follow, fight, fasten. Verse 11, but you men of God, flee. You men of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. The ethical fruits of belief, the opposite values of the deadwood of these false teachers who defy God's authority to rule his church through their inventive philosophies. Flee those controversies and the quarrels stirred up by those who market their twisting of the scriptures on the bookshelves of Kuro, or in the marketplace of the ancient world. Flee to God's life-giving word. Flee from words of empty philosophy spoken by spiritually dead and empty men. Flee from those who speak small of Christ's all-sufficiently. Flee from those who imagine that religion is a means to fleshly gain. Verse 5. We see the connections here with Paul's words spoken in the earlier verses. We're all familiar with the fight or flight response that God created in all human beings. Confronted with a fire in our kitchen, the mind calculates the correct response to the danger. To contain the danger and to move ourselves and others out of harm's way. It is the work of the under shepherd to move his flock towards the quiet waters away from the wolves teeth away from the fire to Th timothy 2:22 recommends flight as the best defense from sensuality flee youthful passions wisdom that would have saved king david and many other of the greats from adultery leading to the dilution of their leadership the pastor is also to flee those who, as we call it today, promote prosperity gospels. In my final year at Sydney Missionary and Bible College, I had the privilege of being amongst graduating students who heard OMF founder J. Oswald Sanders warn our graduating year. He said, brothers, heed the three G's of ministry. Keep away from the girls. Keep away from the gold. Keep away from the glory. The glory is God's, not your own. Be wary even of those who would pat you on the back. The gold, uh, the gold is God's too for his service. Flee all notions of self-entitlement and self-promotion. Flee fleshliness. The girls of the congregation are God's daughters first. He is a jealous father. You are to be a one woman, man, as Paul will put it in 1 Timothy 3 verse 2. By contrast, Paul says, as you flee ungodliness, Timothy, you're to follow. Paul now contends that fleeing is not retreating in fear, but rather in holy fear, it is following the great shepherd. God's servants are to press hard to follow spiritual virtues. The model of Christ you are to pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. The very model of Jesus. Verse 11. Righteousness and godliness cover the horizontal and vertical dimensions of a life of true faith. A desire for justice and fairness in our dealings within and indeed outside of the church. For the reputation of God's ministers inside and out is everything in terms of our useful witness to the world. Proverbs 22 tells us a good name is more desirable than great riches. It is to be esteemed better than silver or gold. Next, Paul commends the ultimate Christian virtues of faith and love in verse 11. Paul regularly couples faith and love in his letters, both here in 1 and 2 Timothy, but also in the Corinthian letters. What is the use of mighty spiritual gifts? without the exercise of love. 1 Corinthians 13 comes to mind. 
Real faith is found only through the expression of love for the lost and a broken world. Last but not least is endurance and gentleness. Steadfast endurance is especially helpful because as I have watched over these 22 years of ministry graduates, some flame out like jet flu, like jet fuel, when we are called to burn long and hot like diesel. While gentleness is a quality of tender, patient self-control in dealing with difficult spotty sheep, I'm reminded here of a YouTube clip of the lion called Bone Digger, who adopted Abby the sausage dog as its best friend. The ridiculous sausage dog nips at the lion's face. The lion knows its own strength, and out of kindness, rather extraordinarily, it refrains from snacking on the ignorant little creature. Gentleness is not weakness, but the power of self-control. It's the power of Jesus' self-control at the cross, isn't it? He could have destroyed us all. And the preacher is called upon to remember that maturity does not happen in our congregations overnight. Like all good parents know, it requires powerful self-control not to eat our children at times. <laughs> For their maturity takes time and patience, even as our teachers dealt with us in Bible college. So see that Paul commands to Tim Timothy to pursue a balanced spirituality in knowing when to flee and when to fight. Remember, this is not just any fight, but a fight for the faith from which some have wandered off to their destruction. The under shepherd is to fight for the defense of the apostolic gospel, the good deposit of which you have been entrusted. In chapter one, verse 18, he is to fight the battle well. This is the language of soldiery or of an elite Olympic athlete, the voluntary agony of a grueling marathon. He is to be diesel, not rocket fuel, if he is to stand in the ring, taking many blows. Jared knows my friend Janelle Plackett. Jared knows Janelle well, who runs uh, marathons competitively. What Jared doesn't know was that some years before, uh, years before I served in the army, Janelle had invited me as a young man to a 90 minute workout at the local gym in Armidale. As a typical 20 year old, I attempted to impress the girl with one-handed push-ups and double burpees. Years later, in fact, some 25 years later, when her family joined our Ingeding church, she reminded me of that workout, I think in reference to the fact that I clearly let myself go since army days. I then had to confess to her that I went home after that workout in Armidale and I was violently ill and I couldn't go to my work at the university for two days. I was so sick. And while she laughed and laughed, Paul's picture here is of a commitment to building strength, to keep running, to not let yourself go until your lungs are burning, to put on the gloves, knowing what it's like to give and indeed to receive blows. Paul himself says in 2 Timothy 4, for I'm already being poured out like a drink offering and the time for my departure is near. Pastors today will also need to build spiritual muscle as we withstand false governments, false teachers, and sadly, false members at times. We must be gentle with the immature, but never pander to their immaturity. And so our final F is the word fasten or take hold. Fasten. Fasten. Pastors are to take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Saved by grace alone, Timothy already had adoption into salvation. This had been confirmed at his conversion before witnesses like his mother and grandmother Eunice and Lois. His election is sure, but the emphasis here is on its quality and unshakable confidence not eroded by fear of oppressors, nor the corroding effects of guilt generated by dabbling in sin and distractions around him. There are many distractions in ministry. We are not to be distracted. 
no pastor goes into ministry for the 5 million Australian pesos at the end of our superannuation, at the end of our vocation, if that means anything to us today in any case. But there are heavenly rewards for which I am not ashamed to be pursuing. Fasting oneself to the vine that is Jesus means letting go of the world's fears, the fear of earthly poverty, the fear of building that big superannuation, the fear of a reputation of being, yes, I am one of those Christians, and holding on to the quiet confidence of a life that trusts in God's providential care and heavenly rewards. Fastened to Jesus while pruning out the temptations of wealth, verses 9 and 10. The fears of will God really provide, verse 8. Many corpses fell in the desert during the Exodus as they doubted the faithfulness of God's provision to them. Achan of Joshua 7 and Ananias of Acts 5 are just two cautionary tales of the deceit of money while distrusting God's providence pastors need to examine themselves in regard to their fears and Paul's phrase take hold of means to grasp like a soul a sailor rather tying his boat to a dock for Christ alone is our firm ground for which we are to make him our own for we have seen men in the church who have not necessarily walked away from salvation, but embittered by trials in the ministry, have walked away from much heavenly reward. These four principles set the stage for Paul's solemn charge to his fellow pastor, as we finish here in verses 13 and 16. Paul issues his charge of duty to Timothy, acknowledging God as the ultimate witness to the promises that Timothy is confessing. In the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and of Christ Jesus, who, while testifying before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession, I charge you, I charge you, Timothy. God had witnessed Israel's pledge of obedience at Mount Sinai, but there presence as witness is well at least rather god's presence as witness is not intimidation but rather one of encouragement as jesus had already modeled before pilate what timothy would also be called to do the father and the son's presence here before timothy and the ephesian uh, congregation the father and the son's presence standing as witness to god's enduring love for his chosen pastors. Steadied by the presence of the Father and the Son, Timothy can bear to hear the Apostle's final solemn charge. I charge you, verse 14, to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. Now, Jared, you may set a record for the shortest ministry if our King Jesus returns tomorrow or tonight. Or indeed, you may set the record for the longest ministry if this world goes on a little more. I heard today from Alan Grant, who's joining us from King Arroy, that uh, Queensland's longest minister served 53 years in Annerley. We're not expecting that. But long or short that the night may be, you are to keep watch. Keep watch for the chief shepherd's coming. Keep watch over your own conduct. Keep the flock in the fold accountable to what is taught. Keep the flock accountable to what is accepted, whether from the pulpit or in their behaviours. For we are seeing the diluting and the straying from belief in so many areas, particularly in regard to what Christians believe about marriage and the sanctity of life. With your session, you are God's watchman in regard to words and deeds in the community of, of Tamworth. Paul completes his charge with a benediction that praises God's sovereignty over his church. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, Paul celebrates God's otherness, his power, to invigorate Timothy's ministry. Paul celebrates God's otherness and his right to rule over what his church is to believe. As Moses brings those words down from Sinai, 
the word which his citizens were to adhere to, all that mighty Moses would ever see of God was the afterglow of his glory. But this same God who came down in the person of Christ Jesus, who was now the witness to Timothy's future ministry, our King and Saviour, is the one who now directs, equips and uses weak vessels like Timothy and even pastors like myself and Jared today to the glory of his great purposes. The message to Timothy, or the message to Jared and all true pastors today is simply, through our call, though our calling is awesome and immense, the God who calls you will also enable you for that service and more rewards that a world of flesh and memon can ever give to you. And so, men of God, having committed yourself to flee, to follow, to fight, and to fasten, accept your charge before God the Father and God the Son to preach and contend and to live out this apostolic gospel until the coming of our Lord Jesus. Maranatha, may our wait be short. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. Let's stand, please, and uh, aloud and together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended yeah, to the dead. You. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, George Brook is going to come and uh, just tell us uh, uh, where we've got to and where we are and what's special about tonight and what's happened just before this. It's uh, called the narration of steps. It means uh, we want to know, George, that everything's been done properly. Just some notes so I don't miss out on something. Um, in January the 1st, 2011, was the first time Jared came this way. Invited by our then minister, who was to supervise him in what they called country placement when they're in training. That was good, that happened over January. June of 2018, the then minister decided he wanted to go on holidays. So he asked Jared to come and, and uh, stand in for him. And that's okay, away we go again. December of that year was when uh, David Hassan decided to go uh, demit the charge and go off to the army as a chaplain. What did he do? Invites David, uh, drives, invites Jared to come and uh, look after the place till we got ourselves going, being school holidays. That was good. So then uh, the Presbytery appointed us a uh, interim moderator, which we are very thankful for. Has done a great job in all this time. And we had a congregational meeting and then we had our uh, nine people elected for the selection committee. After that period of time, one person uh, left the committee. The only reason he left is he went to live in Toowoomba but still has an interest in the place. So then we went looking. And it's not as easy as you think at all. 
So we, we, we um, talked to Presbytery and assured them that things were going right and they wanted to know things, so we progressed on. Then in the start of this year, because we'd had a, we'd had a look at a few people, but for some reason, we always seem to just go so far. And something had happened. We'd say, no, that person just doesn't uh, fit. And we got a list together of questions to give these people some, I think from memory, 10. Then in about February, March, when we had this um, health problem start, uh, we had a meeting and the selection committee said, hmm, how about Jared McNaughton? Yeah. At that particular time, on that particular night, he happened to ring me up on the Sunday night and said, can I drop in at your place uh, tomorrow night on my way through to Andrew Clawson's? Because he didn't have any work in Sydney. Andrew, well, Andrew's daughter didn't have any work. So I had two cars, two dogs and two people the next night at my place. So he continued on. In the meantime, we started dialogue. Our interim moderator and uh, uh, Jared started talking and of course the rest, you know, we had the um, selection committee said yes, a couple of days later, the session, we had, within a week, I think we had meetings, uh, the Sunday we had, the, we had our congregational meeting, and the Monday night, next night, we had a, a session meeting because the following day was supposed to be presbytery but it got changed, but we still continued on. And then, and then we got to this stage. I think that's as far as I wish to go, sir. Well, friends, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the King and Head of the Church, who being ascended on high has given gifts to his people for the building up of the body of Christ, we have met here as a presbytery to ordain and set apart Jared McNaughton into the pastoral charge of this congregation and parish. In this act, the Presbyterian Church of Australia is part of the Holy Catholic Church, worshipping one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, affirms its belief in the gospel of the sovereign grace and love of God, wherein through Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, incarnate, crucified, and risen, he freely offers to all men upon repentance and faith, forgiveness of sins, renewal by the Holy Spirit and eternal life, and calls them to labour in the fellowship of faith for the advancement of the kingdom of God throughout the world. The Presbyterian Church of Australia acknowledges the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be the word of God, the only rule of faith and practice. The Presbyterian Church of Australia holds as its subordinate standard the Westminster Confession of Faith, read in the light of the declaratory statement contained in the basis of union adopted on this church by this church on the 24th of day of July 1901, recognising liberty of opinion on such points of doctrine not essential to the doctrine therein taught, and claiming the right in dependence on the promised guidance of the Holy Spirit to formulate, interpret, or modify its subordinate standard, always in agreement with the word of God and the essential doctrines contained in the subordinate standard. I'd like to ask the members of the congregation, if you're a member of 
uh, Tamworth Community Presbyterian Church. Would you stand, please? I want to ask you a couple of questions, uh, whether you agree to what's going on here and uh, what we're doing tonight. So if you'd stand for a moment. And I'm asking you, the communicants and adherents of this congregation, Tamworth Community Presbyterian Church, do you adhere, do you stick to uh, the appointment of Mr. Jared McNaughton to be your minister? If so, say, we do. And do you now cordially receive him, happily receive him as your minister, promising to provide for him suitable maintenance and give him all due respect, encouragement and obedience in the Lord? How about saying we do with a bit of enthusiasm? We do. Now, that's enthusiasm. Thank you. Do be seated. Uh, Jared, will you come out to the front, please? Uh, I think right to the front so everybody can see. Uh, Jared, I've got to put to you a number of questions that uh, are put to all ministers uh, of the uh, church. Uh, you'll find those questions up there. Uh, Jared, do you believe the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be the word of God, the only rule and faith? and practice? If so, say, I do. I do. Jared, do you own and accept the Westminster Confession of Faith as amended by the General Assembly and read in the light of the declaratory statement contained in the basis of union adopted by this church on the 24th day of July, 1901, as an exhibition of the sense in which you understand the Holy Scriptures and as a confession of your faith? And do you engage firmly and constantly to adhere to and thereto and to the utmost of your power to assert, maintain, and defend the same. If so, say, I do. I do. Uh, Jared, do you own and accept the purity of worship as practiced in this church? I do. Uh, Jared, do you own the Presbyterian form of government to be founded upon the word of God and agreeable thereto? Do you promise that through the grace of God you will firmly and constantly adhere to and the utmost of your power in your station, assert, maintain, and defend the same. I do. Uh, Jared, our zeal for the glory of God, love for the Lord Jesus Christ, and a desire to save souls, not worldly interests or expectations so far as you know your own heart, your great motives and chief inducements for the work of the holy ministry. So say they are. They are. Jared, do you accept this appointment and promise through grace to perform all the duties of a faithful minister of the gospel among this people? I do. Do you promise to give conscientious attendance upon the courts of the church and to direct your best attention to the business thereof, doing all in the spirit of faithfulness, brotherly kindness and charity? So say, I do. I do. Jared, do you promise in the strength of divine grace to lead a holy and circumspect life, to rule well your own house and faithfully, diligently and cheerfully to perform all the parts of the ministerial work to the edifying of the body of Christ in love. If so, say, I do. I do. And Jared, all things, these things you profess and promise through grace, as you shall be answerable at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. If so, say, I do. I do. Thank you. Jared is about to sign a document. Thank you, Lance, which is the, what's called the formula. The clerk of the assembly, the deputy clerk, will read the formula, uh, which is a written statement of what we've just done. Formula to be signed by ministers, licentiates and elders. I own and accept the subordinate standard of this church with the explanations given in the articles contained in the declaratory statement as an exhibition of the sense in which I understand the Holy Scriptures and as a confession of, any faith, of my faith. I further own the purity of worship practised in this church and the Presbyterian government thereof to be founded on the Word of God and agreeably thereto. 
And I promise that through the grace of God, I shall firmly and constantly adhere to the same and to the utmost of my power shall in all my station assert, maintain and defend the doctrine, worship and government of this church. Uh, as a presbytery, we're laying hands on Jared as a sign that we accept him, uh, love him, support him as a brother in Christ, and we're praying for God's spirit to be on him, with him, in his ministry here. Let's pray. Almighty God, you are the chief shepherd the chief shepherd of the church, of the sheep, us sheep. And you've appointed leaders to serve, to serve you, to serve as shepherds in your pe your, of your people. We thank you that Jared, though, through, uh, he's passed his exams, he's been accepted by the presbyteries, that he's been involved as candidate. And now here he is, to be ordained and set apart for the ministry here at Tamworth Community Presbyterian Church. We pray, Lord, for your spirit to fall upon him, to come upon him in power and in might, uh, that he will preach and teach uh, not only the gospel, but give his life as well for your people. We pray that he'll serve you faithfully, whether it be a ministry of just today, if you come again tonight, or whether it be a ministry of 53 years or counting. Bless him for his ministry here and wherever you call him to be. Give him all of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Keep him close to you. Keep him close to uh, the elders of this church. Keep him close to the presbytery as we support him. Keep him uh, in your hands by your spirit. Give him all that's needed for this task. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, who is the King and Head of the Church. Amen. Well, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the King and Head of the Church, and by the authority of the Presbytery of New England, we do declare you, Jared McNaughton, duly ordained and appointed to the pastoral charge of this congregation and parish, and you're entitled to all the rights and privileges belonging to it. And we welcome you with great joy. Three John verses one to four. The elder, to my dear friend Gaius, who I, whom I love in the truth, dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. It gave me great joy to have some brothers come and tell me, 
and tell about your faithfulness to the truth and how you continue to walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Because of COVID, uh, Jared and I have not actually met until this afternoon. So it's, uh, but I, I did enjoy particularly two things. One, I enjoyed hearing the story of your conversion. That was a wonderful story. I really enjoyed that. And secondly, uh, reading, hearing about the books that you were reading. You were reading good books, and that is very important. That, uh, that was good. And I think Charles Simeon was also 53 years uh, at Cambridge, so, and he preached and then died. So, uh, in, quite honestly, I pray that the Lord will sustain you for 53 years uh, and everything. Can I also add... Uh, Thank you to those uh, who have helped, uh, particularly with preaching in the last two years, and pray that God will have blessed your words in many ways. Uh, a charge, a charge is, is not, it's not a word that we're used to hearing very much, except we sometimes hear it in the past tense, such as the police charged someone with something. But this is a charge for the future. This is looking to the future. We, we charge you to do this. And there are two charges here. The first one is for Jared. Uh, I will read the charge for Jared. And then the second one will be for the TCPC congregation. So to begin with, Jared. And we pray over every word that is said here. Pray that it will be true. Uh, may the Holy Spirit give his strengthening and his blessing to this in every way. Well, Jared, you, you've been called by the Lord God himself, and now ordained and appointed to shepherd this church that God himself has redeemed through his son and our saviour. Would you like to stand up, actually? I might be better. <laughs> um, yeah, come on. Join us. Then there are six par parts to the charge I have. I charge you, therefore, in the name of Jesus Christ, to fulfill all that you've been called to do in a manner that is worthy of him, with all humility, that daily you, you put on uh, the clothes of humility, the, the uniform of humility before God and others, and with all patience. And I charge you to labour, to work hard in God's word and in true doctrine, and to equip God's people to live lives honouring to him. And I charge you, and this will pick up on Andrew's words, I charge you to flee from anything that would allow the devil a foothold. I charge you to avoid godless chatter and to hate the things that God hates, but to love the things that God loves. I charge, I charge you to follow steadfastly all that is good and right and holy in our Lord. And in that regard, I charge you not to let the habit of reading your Bible be broken. Now, don't let the good things of life, whether they be joy, laughter, nor bad routines, nor anything else, prevent you from coming to God's Word humbly in prayer. Do not burden yourself. Uh, do not allow others to burden you with other business so that you may be deprived of the time and the energy, especially in prayer, that is necessary to, to prepare adequately. And yet be generous to your people. I charge you to fight. I fight the good fight of faith. And I impress upon you to realise your utter dependence on the Holy Spirit and to pray earnestly that he would give you strength and power in his word. And I charge you to fasten, uh, fasten yourself to Christ Jesus always and never allow yourself to become embittered and so walk away from your heavenly reward, uh, to hold certain things light, lightly and yet to hold all things seriously before God. And in these words, uh, verses, 1 Peter 5, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, Exercise oversight, not under comp compulsion, but willingly, 
as God would have you, and not for shameful gain, but eagerly, day by day, uh, eager to serve God, a spirit of eagerness there. It's a great responsibility, but also one of the, it is the highest privilege to shepherd God's people, and we don't say that lightly. Not domineering after, over those in your charge, but being examples to the flocks, to the flock. And a pastor is to tackle every issue in the light of scripture and with much prayer. We're to bring God's word to all people, uh, whatever their background and whatever their circumstances are, seeking that, that God would work through his word by the power of his spirit. And, and Jared, you're, you're to persevere uh, moment by moment, bringing God's word and not growing weary in doing good. And so in the presence of God and the risen Lord Jesus, remember it's the risen Lord Jesus who gives his people pastors and teachers. I charge you with these very serious things and I, I pray and I trust that the God of peace will strengthen you and protect you and he'll deepen your, no, your knowledge and your love for him. And may he do all this to glorify his name. And that's the charge I bring to you, Jared. Um, I've given Jared a copy of this charge. You can keep it in his Bible. <laughs> so this is for the TCPC congregation, whether here or whether on uh, via the video. Uh, we read before from 3 John verses 1 to 4. It was verse 4 in particular that, that, to draw your attention to. I have no greater joy, says John, than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. And immediately, immediately you think, am I, are you walking in the truth? Where do you stand before God? Are you holding fast to Christ? If you truly be a Christian, are you holding fast to all that you are in him? Whether things are going well in life or whether things are going poorly, great disappointments in life, nonetheless, I, I pray that through it all, you will walk in the truth. It's a command. It's a call and a command, really. A moment by moment thing to walk in the truth of God, in, in his word, the Bible. And there is no greater joy than to see that, to see Whatever the circumstances, people, young, men, women, children, walking in the truth. And I pray that Jared will see that in TCPC, that you're thirsty to know God more and more and you take his word very serious, his word is serious to you, and that you want to obey God, even when it's hard. And I pray that you'll be learning to kill pride uh, daily, so that you can say what John the Baptist said of our Lord, that he must increase and I must decrease. And that you're making good decisions. You, you choose your company well. You're not, you don't give in to the common world view of people. But no, you've learnt to examine everything in the light of God's word. And I pray that you're not giving in to the flesh, but fighting for what is right. And you're pressing on. And I pray that what John knew... Jared will now know that it thrills me to hear and to see that you are walking in the truth. Now, it's that verse that I wish just to highlight to you tonight, uh, walking in the truth. Where do you stand before God Almighty? And are you walking in his truth even tonight? And, and with that, we'll come now to the, the charge for TCPC congregation. And this is what we charge you with. Brothers and sisters at TCPC, you, you have heard the vows that Jared has taken and the obligations laid on him as, as shepherd, a pastor, a servant of our Lord Jesus. And therefore, I charge you, a congregation, you know, I think Jared had six parts to his charge. There's eight to yours. So. Uh, I charge you to honour and uphold him. Jared. I charge you to pray for him in accordance with God's will and to pray earnestly for him. 
I charge you to never neglect meeting together as you're able to, to worship our great God. I charge you not merely to hear what God's word says, but to put it into practice, to listen and to do. I charge you to make diligent use of the means of grace that God has given us, including baptism and the Lord's Supper. I charge you to use the gifts that the Holy Spirit has given each of you to help build up the body of Christ. I charge you to encourage Jared with your love and your fellowship, and that's a wonderful thing. And I charge you to support him as you have pledged yourselves and to strive to do all these things in the sight of our Lord until he returns. And may God himself, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and God, the three in one, may glory and honour and worship and praise be given to him. And may we trust and obey and love him now and forever through the rest of our lives and into eternity. Amen. Now that brings us to the end of our midweek service. We're here tonight to remember our Father in heaven. Uh, we're here tonight to remember the work of our Lord Jesus, who has, uh, through his sacrifice, enabled us to have this incredible relationship with our God. Uh, that's why we're here tonight. Uh, that's why we'll be here on Sunday morning, and that's why we'll continue to meet every Sunday, uh, whether that's in this room or through a screen because of COVID. One way or another, we'll continue to glorify our Father in heaven because uh, that is what we have been called to do. So with that in mind, I'd like to finish with one of my favorite Bible verses that I think really captures that point. It comes from the end of the book of Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.